I want to give you a, just a little bit of a test today. I don't think it's going to be difficult for you, but uh, kind of an agricultural test. So I'm going to put a picture of some trees up on the screen, and I want you to identify those trees for me, okay? So here's the first tree. What kind of tree is that? Boy, come on, can you not see it? That's an apple tree. Are you awake this morning? Okay, all right, it's not a trick question. All right, what kind of tree? Oh, okay. Or, okay, now we're catching on. Orange tree, what's the next one? But, man, I'm telling you what, you are a sharp, some of you are three for three. You got 100% so far. How about the next one? You know what this one is? Ooh, some of you know I thought I would trick you. That's an Atemoya tree, all right? Actually very prevalent here in South Florida. Um, some of you might know. I don't know whether I've ever eaten one of those before, but that, that's a tropical fruit. Now, great job. You did great at the test. So, so, so let's go back and think about it. So how did we know that the apple tree was an apple tree? There, there were apples on it. How did we know that the orange tree was an orange tree? There were oranges. We knew that the banana tree was a banana tree because of what? Because of the fruit that it produced, right? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand all of that. Each tree is identified by its fruits. Um, We can say the same thing about our families. Parents produce children that, to a great degree, look like them, and act like them. I mean, if you look at our son, Mark, from one side, he looks like Vicky. From the other side, he looks like Brian. It doesn't, I mean, not really, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, But but you look at him, and you can tell that he's a Burkholder. Vicky was down in Guatemala the last couple of weeks, and she was with our granddaughter, Isabella. And you put them side by side, and you can tell that they're related. Can you not? I mean, they what? They, uh, they look alike. You look at that and you say, man, they have got to be from the same family. Parents produce children that look like them. And let me also say this. Today's message is not about parenting. But parents also produce children that act like them. We'll actually see that later in the message. In today's passage, Jesus takes that principle and applies it to those who claim to speak for him. Here's what Jesus says in the passage, and we're going to read it just as a moment. Just like a tree produces a certain type of fruit, the success of a prophet, the success of a preacher, the veracity, the integrity of a pastor is proven by the fruit they are producing. And in the verses that we're going to look at today, Jesus talks about true prophets and false prophets. And to use a modern day terminology, we don't use the term prophet that often, but Jesus is talking about true preachers and teachers of God's word and false preachers and teachers of God's word. And how you and I can know the difference. And so we're in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Follow along. I'll put it on the screen. I'm reading out of the ESV. You follow along with the version that you're reading. Jesus says this, beware of false prophets. Prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous Wolves. We're going to describe exactly what that phrase means because it's very interesting and it's going to surprise you. You will recognize them by their fruits. You might want to underline that phrase. Let me read it again. He said these 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 preachers, these prophets, these people who come along and claim to speak for God, you will recognize them by their fruits. Then he asks a series of questions that basically state the same thing. He says, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? And we know the answer to that is, is no. Are, are figs gathered from thistles? No, obviously figs come from a, a fig tree or a, a fig plant. Uh-uh. I'm not really up on that, so I'm not exactly sure. But, but, but they come from a fig tree or fig plant. Verse 17, so every, notice, every healthy tree bears good fruits, but the diseased tree bears bad fruits. 
Then, then he takes it a step further. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruits, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruits. Then he says, every tree that does not bear good fruits is cut down, and it's thrown into the fire. And he says one more time, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Would you pray with me today? Lord, today we need your wisdom to understand this passage of Scripture. Lord, as we've already mentioned today, we're so glad that we have the Holy Spirit of God who indwells us. And he is described as, as the great teacher, the one who takes your word and personalizes it to our life. And so we pray that the great teacher would help us to understand this passage. God, I pray you'd give me wisdom today. Help me to be wise as a serpent. Help me to be harmless as a dove. And yet at the same time, God, help me to be bold to say exactly what your word is saying and help us to have the courage and the boldness to receive it and apply it to our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, last Sunday, Pastor Jose did a fabulous job um, preaching out of verses 13 and 14. If you haven't listened to his message, I'd encourage you to go on our website and, and, and you can listen to his message. Uh, basically, here was his message, that all of us are on one of two roads. We are either on the broad road that leads to destruction. And as he mentioned in the passage, the broad road is the one that many people are on. Or else we are on the narrow road that is traveled, that is traversed by just a small group of people. And it's that road that leads to life. In the verses that we're studying today, Jesus doesn't change the topic. He doesn't segue from that on to something else, but, but he actually continues that thought by proving that everyone who claims to speak for God does not represent him. In other words, there are individuals who stand up and say, this is the way you should go. And they call themselves a prophet, they call themselves a preacher, but they're actually leading people not towards life, but they're leading people towards destruction. They're actually leading them not in the way that, that, that will help them to grow in their relationship with God. Instead of leading them to life, to Jesus, and to discipleship, they point people towards self-centeredness. They point people towards shallow Christianity. They point people towards materialism that eventually leads to destruction. So, so Jesus says some really practical things here. And so today I want to be practical. I want to exegete the passage in our first point. And then I, I want to take a moment and be as practical as I possibly can and, and, and give you some tools to help identify false teachers. And by the way, we want you to use these tools that we're giving to uh, evaluate us as well. Uh, we're not just talking about other preachers and other people who uh, claim to speak for God. You use these questions, these tools to evaluate us as well, to make sure that we are, are saying what God desires for us to say, and we're saying that which is true to God's word. So if you're following in your outline today, the first point is very simple. It comes from verse 15. Jesus says this, beware of false prophets. The word beware, as, as you know, is a word of warning. The word beware warns of danger. It's a call to be on guard against something that is harmful. All of us have seen as we're walking through our neighborhoods and maybe we're approaching someone's house, we've seen that song that, or, or that sign that says this, beware of the dog. Now what does that generally mean? 
That means that there's a dog in the house that could hurt us. I know people have started using that, and they have these real little dogs that wouldn't hurt anybody, but they use it kind of to keep strangers away. But, but that is a what? That, uh, that is a warning sign that there's a dog in the house that potentially could do you harm. Um, in most of the lakes around South Florida, we see this sign, danger, beware of alligators. What's the idea? That potentially there could be an alligator in the lake, so you don't want to swim there because if you swim in the lake, you what? You could get eaten by an alligator. Those are what? Those are warning signs. Um, I saw this next one. I'm not sure how to comment on it. Warning, never mind the dog, beware of the wife. uh uh-uh. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that. You can, you can interpret that any way you want, all right? But, but, but beware has the idea of what? It has the idea of warning. Now, <laughs> here in the passage, don't anybody go out and buy that last sign, all right? I don't want to go visit anybody's house and, and see that sign outside your house. He, here Jesus uses that word and he says, beware of false prophets. The term, if, if we wrote the term, you would understand the Greek term. The Greek term is pseudo-prophetone, false prophets. It's a word that's found 11 times in the New Testament. Here's what the word refers to. It refers to a person who teaches what is false, but they teach it in God's name. They teach something that is error, but they teach it as if they were representing God. It's someone who pretends to speak the word of the Lord, but in fact that person is an imposter. That person is not truly speaking for God. Quite frankly, as you read through your Bibles, you're going to find warning after warning after warning about false prophets. They're found throughout the Old Testament, and they're found throughout the New Testament. Let me mention a few to you. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain words. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. So here are these prophets who claim to speak for God, but in reality they weren't speaking for God. They were saying what they wanted to say. They spoke out of their own visions, and they did not speak the words of the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 13 and verse 9, my hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and who give lying divinations. Matthew 24 and verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the very elect. The first two verses, we're talking about what took place in the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 24 is not talking about what had already taken place, but what is going to take place. And and Matthew says that there are going to be people who are going to rise up who will claim to speak for God. Some of them themselves will claim to be Christ. We see that. Even here in South Florida, we have seen that. They'll do great signs and wonders. Listen, listen, don't be convinced that just because someone does something somewhat miraculous or just because someone has a great crowd that is following them that they are necessarily speaking for God. Jesus says, man, they can do great signs and wonders and they're going to have multitudes that are going to follow after them. And if possible, if it were possible, they are such great deceivers that they would deceive even the very elect, those who have been chosen by God. So in today's passage, Jesus gives a simple yet clear description of false prophets. And I want you to see it in the passage. The first thing Jesus says is this. He says, false prophets are deceptive. False prophets are deceptive. Notice how Jesus describes them. He says that they come dressed in sheep's clothing. 
Outwardly, they're dressed in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. Now, it's interesting to note that false prophets do not deceive the flock by impersonating the sheep. False prophets deceive the sheep by impersonating the shepherd. The, the, they come to the congregation impersonating the shepherd. Shepherds during New Testament times wore woolen garments. They actually would make their garments from the sheep that they had taken care of. And shepherds were known for a distinct way of dress. And by the way, prophets also were known with a distinctive way of dressing. And these false prophets would come. They wouldn't have a sign on their forehead that said, I'm a false prophet. No, they would come. They would look. They would act. They would talk. They would walk just like the real thing. But they weren't. They, they were being deceitful. They were being deceptive. Here's what Jesus says. They present themselves as shepherds who care about the sheep, but in reality, they are self-serving. They act as if their concern is for the sheep. But their concern is not for the sheep. They're not a true shepherd. They're in it for themselves. Hey, hey, catch this. Satan's preachers pretend to be God's men. Satan's preachers pretend to be God's men. The Apostle Paul even says later, I didn't put the verse on the screen, that they present themselves as angels of light, as if they were messengers of God. As I mentioned, they walk, they talk, they dress, they act like God's ambassadors. But in reality, they deceive. In reality, they mislead. And if possible, they destroy God's people. Here, here's the second thing that I want you to catch, and it's so very important. They use biblical terminology, but they twist biblical truth and give it their own meaning. They use biblical terminology. Um, hey, just because someone reads from the Bible, just because someone uses Christian words and phrases does not mean that they are teaching biblical truth. Some of these are experts at taking a passage of Scripture and giving it a meaning that God did not intend for it to mean. And quite frankly, you and I can find a verse on the Bible that could prove anything we want to talk about. And we could take a verse and we could twist it and give it the meaning that we want it to have. That's why when we sit and prepare messages, whether it's myself or Brad or Jose or, or even Mark, we sit back and the very first question we ask is this, what was the original intent of the author? When the Holy Spirit of God inspired that prophet, that apostle, to write those words, what was the message that the Holy Spirit of God wanted to convey? I'm not giving the meaning to the text. I am pulling the meaning from the text. We need to be very, very careful. As I mentioned, they're experts at reading a passage of Scripture and giving it the meaning that they want it to have. Here's the warning. Don't be deceived by them. Here's the second thing. Jesus says false prophets are not only deceitful, they're, they're not only deceptive, but false prophets are dangerous. Now, notice what he says in verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you dressed in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, how are they? Inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. Notice that these Preachers of God's word are described as wolves. Now, that might not be something you and I are, com are, com are, are understand. I don't think there are a lot of wolves in South Florida, but, but in Palestine, in, in, in Israel, during uh, biblical times, wolves were the most common natural enemy of sheep. Shepherds were always on the lookout, uh, protecting sheep from wolves who were on the prowl. 
And so Jesus says that these, these supposed conveyors of God's word, they're not sheep, they're not shepherds, they're wolves. They're, they're, they're wolves whose purpose is to destroy the sheep. Notice the word that Jesus uses. He uses two words, not only the word wolf or wolves, but he uses the word ravenous. They are ravenous wolves, a, a word that has the idea of being merciless, a word that has the idea of being ferocious. Let me give you two applications. The first you'll understand, the second one might surprise you a bit, but it will fit right into, um, sadly, what we're experiencing in much of, of evangelicalism today. The first is this, as ravenous wolves, they destroy the sheep. As ravenous wolves, they destroy the sheep. Wolves roamed the hills and the valleys looking for sheep that had strayed away from the flock and had lagged behind. When such a sheep was found, they they were quickly attacked by the wolves and and that sheep was tore to pieces. By the way, it, it was important for the sheep to remain with the flock because the protection was where? The protection was with the flock. And when the sheep all of a sudden was found by itself, the sheep at that moment was what? It was vulnerable. It needed to be within the fold. What a great application for us because when we find ourselves all alone, there is a roaring lion, there is a roaring wolf who is trying his best to devour us. And when we find ourselves alone, we find ourselves vulnerable. Well, Jesus uses that term speaking of these false teachers. He said that, that, that these false prophets are not interested in the sheep. They're not looking out for the sheep. They're not protecting the sheep. As a result, many sheep are destroyed. Uh, Let me pause for a second because I think that kind of hits home when you think about it to maybe some of us here today or, or maybe some people that you and I know. How often have you heard of a person who was hurt by a pastor who was hurt by a spiritual leader. Someone who that believer thought was looking out for their best interest, but they found out later on that that leader was not looking out for their best interest, and that sheep was what? That sheep was wounded. That sheep was hurt. And at times, that sheep, that person was destroyed. You and I have met people like that. We'll talk to them today, and they say, you know what? I don't want anything to do with church. Man, in church I was hurt. Someone wounded me. There was, a, there was a leader who wasn't interested in me, who wasn't looking out for me, who didn't care for me. Maybe you're here today and maybe that describes you. Maybe you've been hurt by a ravenous wolf whose ministry destroys sheep. But this word has another meaning. The second thing, the first one is ravenous wolves, they destroy the sheep. But the second is ravenous wolves, they benefit themselves. It's really interesting, that word ravenous is used like five times in the New Testament. This is the only time that I could find that the word is described or translated ravenous. In the other verses, here's the way that that word is, is translated swindler, extortioner, same word. I know we have no idea exactly what meaning Jesus wanted to give, but Jesus very possibly could have said, man, these false prophets, they dress like shepherds, but inwardly, they're swindlers. Inwardly, they're extortioners. Inwardly, they are peddlers of the gospel as the Apostle Paul describes them. And they're not looking out for the sheep, they're only looking out for themselves. Jesus is referring to spiritual leaders who use their position of influence. Spiritual leaders who even use the word of God to get rich and to swindle others. Listen, I told you I was going to be a little direct today. I'm going to be, beware of preachers 
Beware of preachers that tell you that you need to give a financial gift in order to receive a blessing. Beware of that. If someone says, hey, you know what? You need to plant the seed. You need to give me a certain amount of money and you're going to be blessed. Beware of that. That, that, I don't know that person's heart, but, but I do know that that type of blessing is not found in Scripture. We, we need to understand that. Beware of preachers who have become wealthy as a result of their ministry. Beware of preachers who exploit others for their own benefit. Peter talks about that in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2, let me read you a few verses. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, Peter says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false prophets, false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. The idea is not that they're going to have a sign saying, hey, you know what? I'm teaching heresy. I'm teaching something that goes against God's word. No, they would. They do it secretly. They, they do it in a way that many people do not detect. Notice the phrase, even denying the master who bought them. Verse 3, for time's sake. Verse 3, Peter says, and in their greed... They will exploit you with false words. What does Jesus say? Look out for false prophets. They not only have existed, but they will exist among you. Those false prophets are deceptive. Those false prophets are dangerous. He gives a third thing in the passage. He says those false prophets are fruitless. Notice verse 18. He says, you will recognize them by their fruits. Just as we saw that an apple tree produces what? Apples. An orange tree produces oranges. A banana tree you've caught on produces bananas. He's saying a true disciple of Jesus Christ will produce disciples. A false prophet will produce false disciples. Let me give you a few practical ways that false teachers are fruitless. What does Jesus mean when he says you'll recognize them by their fruits? Notice the first thing that I wrote is this. They cannot produce in others what is not a reality in their own life. They cannot produce in others what is not a reality in their own life. Verse 18 says, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruits. And a diseased tree cannot produce good fruit. A diseased tree will produce what? Diseased fruit. A good tree will produce what? Good fruit. Fruit, a tree cannot produce what that tree is not. And a teacher cannot produce what that teacher is not. Listen, a proud person cannot emulate humility. A selfish person cannot demonstrate generosity. An ungodly person, even though they feign godliness, an ungodly person cannot encourage others to live a life of holiness. A faithless person cannot motivate others to true faith in Jesus Christ. You cannot produce what you are not. You must be it before you can produce it. Let me just pause and stop teaching for a second and start preaching and just meddle for just a second. Because that truth not only applies to preachers, that truth applies to parents as well. Moms and dads, in order for your kids to be holy, guess what you've got to be? Holy. In order for your kids to put Jesus first, guess what you must do? Put Jesus first. 
in order for your kids to have a love for the Word of God, a love for God's people, a love for God's church, guess what you need to demonstrate? You need to demonstrate a love for God's Word, a love for God's people, and a love for God's church. You see, Jesus is saying, listen, you will know them by their fruits, and they cannot produce what they are not. There's a second thing that Jesus says, although although some preachers may achieve success and have many followers, they're not producing true disciples of Jesus Christ. Listen, don't be deceived, and I'm going to be very tame with my words today. Don't be deceived into thinking that just because a ministry is large, just because a pastor is famous, just because someone has written a book, or just because someone has a television program, that that is a demonstration of God's blessing upon their life. You can be an excellent communicator and be an ungodly person. You can be a fantastic writer and not be pointing people to Jesus. You can have the charisma that will draw thousands of people to you and not point them to Jesus Christ. Here's what Jesus says. Judge him by his fruits. What is that individual really producing? And here... Here's the third thing Jesus says. Jesus says, eventually, eventually, their ministry will be seen for what it really is. Notice verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruits is cut down and it's thrown into the fire. I sit back and think, wow, what a stinging statement. What a harsh statement that Jesus pronounces to preachers, to individuals who stand behind, whether we want to call it a pulpit or a sacred desk, to individuals who open up God's word and have the courage to say, thus saith the Lord. Jesus says, everyone who does not teach my words Everyone who is not true to the word of God, everyone who is not producing fruits, one day, doesn't matter how tall and majestic that tree is, doesn't matter how beautiful that tree is, one day that tree will be chopped down and that tree will be cast into the fire. As I mentioned, although at times they have fame and fortune and followers, God sees them for who they really are. And one day they, and quite frankly, every single one of us will be judged accordingly. Let let me just pause for a second and say, and and I know I can speak for myself and Pastor Jose and and Brad and, and Mark and all of those who stand and teach God's word. We take very, very seriously the responsibility that we have. Because as much as I want to preach in such a way that you enjoy the message, and and there's nothing that tickles a pastor's ears more than after the service for someone to say, boy, that was a really good message. All of us like to hear that. We want to preach in a way that's enjoyable. We want to teach in a way that draws crowds. But, But listen to me, this is so very important. In reality, there is only one person that we should be worried about pleasing with our preaching, and that is Jesus Christ. Because one day we will stand before him. One day I will stand before him, and I'll give an account, yes, for being a husband, yes, for being a father, yes, for all of those things, but as a pastor, I believe there is a high calling, and one day I will stand before God and give account for the faithfulness with which I have taught or not taught his word. So here's what Jesus says, beware of false prophets. Beware of those who come dressed in shepherd's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. Now, I want to 
I want to kind of flesh that out just a little bit more for you today. And we generally don't bounce away from the passage, but I want to for just a second because I want to help you to learn to identify false teachers. In a day and age in which we are bombarded with so many people claiming to speak truth, how can you and I detect truth from error? How, how can we sit back and know what is false and what is real? How can we know who to listen to and who to turn off or who to tune out? Uh, let me give you a couple of questions. And, and by the way, the first way is somewhat obvious, and I don't mention it, but the first way is this. You have to know the Word of God. You have to spend time in the Word of God so that whenever someone states something that is contrary to God's Word, there's all of a sudden a red light and a bell that starts going off in your life. And you say, wait a second, wait a second. I believe that's contrary to what God's Word says. By the way, I hope I'm not speaking of our congregation, but we live, our generation is one of the most biblically illiterate generations that has ever lived in our country today. We spend very little time in God's word. We don't know God's word. And so therefore, we hear someone say something and we believe it because we don't know the truth. Here's a great exhortation. Turn off the television and spend time in God's word. Spend time in God's word every day. That's the only way that you are going to know what is real by spending time with him. Let me give you four questions to ask as you listen to a preacher or someone who claims to speak for God, the first question is this, is his life consistent? Is his life consistent? First Timothy chapter three gives us the qualifications, the biblical qualifications for what the Bible calls a bishop and overseer, depending upon your, the, the translation that you have or a pastor. I want to take the time and read them and put them up on the screen because these aren't Brian's qualifications. These are God's qualifications that God has given. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, therefore an overseer or a bishop or a pastor must be above reproach. Let me just pause there for a second. The word, the word above reproach, some, some, some might say blameless. The idea is this, that there is, there is nothing that anyone can grab a hold of in that preacher's life. Something, uh, whether it's a sin, whether it's a, a ungodly characteristic, whether it's an anger problem, whether it's a self-control problem, there's nothing anyone can grab a hold of in that preacher's life. They are, here's what the, the word means, they are ungrabbable. It doesn't mean that they're perfect, but it means that they're living in such a way that there's nothing that you can really grab a hold of. I remember um, years ago, I was a, uh, still probably am a little bit, I was a Cleveland Browns fan, and uh, we had a running back named Greg Pruitt. Some of you old football fans might remember that, and, and Greg Pruitt, until they became a, um, illegal, wore these tore away, tear away jerseys, and so whenever he was running, somebody would grab his jersey, and his jersey would just rip, and there'd be, he'd have to change his jersey over and over and over again throughout the game, because he wore this jersey that no one could grab a hold of. And so uh, he had a benefit that others didn't have, and they, they made those jerseys illegal. But, but to a certain degree, that's what, that's what Paul is describing here. Not that we have a tearaway jersey, that there's nothing that sticks to us, but as pastors, we live in such a way that, that we're above reproach. The husband of one wife. The text literally means a one-man woman sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Verse three, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must, he must manage his own household with well, or well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. If someone does not know how to manage his own household, how in the world will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert. He must not be puffed up with pride, with conceit, because if that's the case, he'll fall into the condemnation of the devil. Verse seven, moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare 
of the devil. So, so here's what, what Paul says under the inspiration of Scripture. You want to know who to listen to. Find someone who teaches God's word, who lives in a way that their life is a above reproach. They're self-controlled. They're not a drunkard. You say, Brian, does that happen? Yes, it does, even in ministry. In the last month, a very famous pastor in our country, one of the largest evangelical churches in our country, had to step down because he was abusing alcohol. He had become a drunkard. Does that individual love his wife? Look, look at that preacher's kids. How, how are those kids living out? What is that home like? Observe his lifestyle. Is his life consistent with his message? Or is he saying one thing and living something else? Here's a second question. Is his message Christ-centered? Is his message Christ-centered? I'm not asking whether he mentions Jesus in his sermons, but rather do his messages exalt Jesus Christ? Does he make the gospel about us or about Jesus? Is Jesus the hero of the story or is he the hero of the story? One of, the, one of the trends that's taking place in evangelicalism today is what we call therapeutic preaching. That, 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 that as pastors, we have a tendency to just preach on things that, that, that people need, that somewhat tickle their ears, that make them feel good about themselves. Jesus is kind of placed to the sidelines, and the message becomes about us. There are many preachers today who use Jesus as a means to an end. The gospel is not, or the gospel ends up not being about Jesus, but the gospel ends up about us being happy, about us being prosperous, about us having a great life now. Catch this, church. God's ultimate goal in your life and mine is not our happiness. God's ultimate goal is our holiness. And God, if necessary, will take us through the refiner's fire. God, if necessary, will take us through different difficult moments in our life to burn the dross off so that we what? So that we become like him. Over, over my vacation, I was off for about 10 days. Over my vacation, I read a book that kind of shook my world. Just a little book, I, and I would highly recommend that I read a book called The Insanity of God. You can find it on Amazon. You can actually download it on your Kindle for $2.99, and I would encourage you to do that. But it talked about believers who were being persecuted around the world. It, it gave testimonies of believers in Russia and in China and in Southeast Asia and in different parts of Africa who were literally suffering for the cause of Christ. And the author asked this one pastor in Russia who told an unbelievable story of suffering, what he, what he suffered and gave up for the gospel. And the author asked this pastor this. He said, man, has anybody ever told your story? We need to tell your story. And the pastor's response was, no, you don't need to tell my story. And the author said, why, yes, we do. And he said, haven't you ever read the Bible? Because the Bible is filled with stories of people who suffered for the gospel. If we're not careful, we get this idea, and it's being conveyed in evangelicalism today, that Jesus died so that you and I can be prosperous. Boy, that's, that's certainly not found in Scripture. And it's only a gospel that is able to be preached in the United States and it's not a gospel that's able to be preached around the world. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 1.23, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the Gentiles. They don't want to embrace it. They want something else. But Paul says, no, we preach Jesus Christ crucified. 1 Corinthians 2.2, for I have decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So here's a great question to ask about someone who stands and preaches God's word. Is it Christ-centered? 
Is their message Christ-centered? Here, here's a third question. Let me go quickly. Is his preaching complete? By that I mean, does he preach all of God's word or only the parts of God's word that are comfortable? Only the parts of God's word that are easy to preach. Here's what Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3. Paul says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but they will have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers, catch this, to suit their own passions. Teachers and preachers who what? Make them feel good about themselves. You need to be careful of that. Beware of preachers who are afraid to preach on sin. Beware of preachers who are afraid to preach on hell. Beware of preachers who are afraid to preach on holiness. Listen, those certainly are not enjoyable topics, but they are part of God's word, and we must not ignore them. Paul said this in Acts chapter 20 and verse 27, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Not just the easy parts, but the difficult part. Here's the fourth question. Are his converts committed? Is his ministry producing committed followers of Jesus Christ? Believers who will remain faithful even when trials and tribulations come. Jesus said this in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. He gives this command to the church and he says, Be faithful even unto death. So here's Jesus' warning for us. Beware. Be wary of. Be on guard against false teachers. Learn to identify them. Before I close, though, I think there's one, it behooves us, there's one other point that I think we need to make in the passage. And the other point is this. You also are identified by your fruit. Not only are prophets and pastors identified by their fruit, but you and me, we are identified by the fruit that we are producing as well. Verse 20, he says once again, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. The word fruits found seven times in these verses. You will recognize them. They will be identified by their fruits. Next week's passage, I don't want to preach next week's passage because then you won't come back next week. But <laughs> in next week's passage, Jesus says, there are many, there's going to be many who claim to be followers of me. There are going to be many who say, hey, we went to church in your name. We did all of these things in your name. And Jesus says, my response to them is going to be this. Depart from me. I never knew you. It's so easy to call ourselves believers, especially in a country in which there's no persecution. I mean, it's no skin off our back to say that we're a follower of Jesus Christ. We can call ourselves anything we want. But the question is this. I'm not asking you today what you call yourself. I'm asking you today, do the fruits of your life back up what you claim to be? Are you claiming to be an apple tree today, but you're producing oranges? Are you claiming to be an orange tree today, but you're producing bananas? Are you claiming to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but you don't act like a follower of Jesus Christ? Your, your vocabulary has not changed. Your emotions are not controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. You are not living in a way that truly honors and glorifies Him. You can say whatever you want, but your fruit produces who you are. Someone has said just a stupid statement. You can sleep in a garage, but that doesn't make you a car. <laughs> <laughs> 
You can come to church on Sunday, but that doesn't make you a follower of Jesus Christ. By your fruits, you will be known. I'll give you three questions to ask yourself today, and we're done. Question number one, do you have a passion for the word of God? Really? You have a passion. Can you, can you get in, read, read one verse, and then, hey, hey, I'm done. Life's too busy. Don't have a passion to spend time in God's word. Do you have a pa- Hey, remember, remember, guys, when you fell in love years ago? I mean, some of us are older, and, you know, before text messages and everything, we had to write these things called letters. Remember that? And you would get a letter from your girlfriend at the time, and you would what? Man, you'd keep that in your wallet. You'd keep that in your pocket. At least I did when Vicki wrote me letters, and I would what? I would read them over and over and over and over again until I got what? Until I got the next letter. Well, God's word is his letter for you. And I'm amazed at how many believers say, man, I love Jesus. I, I, I just love him. But they spend no time in God's word. Do you have a passion for the word of God. Are you becoming more like Jesus? Can you sit back and say, man, I'm not what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. God is little by little molding me and shaping me into his image. I am becoming like him. By the way, that's what the word Christian means, little Christs, little replicas of Jesus Christ. And our challenge is to be like him. Are you becoming more like Jesus? And the third thing is this. Are your words and actions pointing people to Jesus Christ? Christians produce Christians. Followers of Jesus Christ produce followers of Jesus Christ. Followers of Jesus Christ demonstrate Christ-like actions. Followers of Jesus Christ become like him. Here's the words of Paul, and I'm done. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. And all things are becoming new. Does that verse describe your life? You will be known. You are known by your fruits. We're identified by our fruit. <music>